This is the Venturing Angler Podcast. I'm Tim Harden. In this episode, we're chatting with world-traveling angler and photographer Dave McCoy of Emerald Water Anglers about his travels throughout the world. As a bonus, at the end of the podcast, once we finished recording, he and I ended up having a really good conversation. I think some of you will enjoy that, and we've thrown that in at the end, too. So once it sounds like it's over, part of the conversation is just beginning. Let's chat with Dave. All right, we're here with Dave McCoy of Emerald Water Anglers. Dave, welcome to the Venturing Angler Podcast. <laughs> Tim, it has been a long time coming, buddy. I'm yeah, excited seriously. to be here, man. Well, it has. It, it's been a long time coming, and, and you've always, you always have so many things going on that I always feel like that if we were to do a podcast, it would become obsolete pretty quickly. And so um, <laughs> let's just look at, at, at you know, you're, as, in the introduction, I say that you're a world uh, traveling angler and photographer. And so, you know, just to get things going, where in the world have you done these things? Oh, well, um, and that's, that's a, that's a fabulous way to start this. And I will, I want to immediately pay homage to some of, uh, my fellow photographers and certainly some incredible ones that have probably not even probably have certainly been to more places and have done this for, longer and um than i have um like gregson as we were talking about earlier i've been i've done this in 47 countries it would be i'd be curious to ask brian how many countries he's fly fished and photographed in so i'm sure it has to be more but um yeah 47 countries wow. which as you start to look around the globe you start getting into some interesting places pretty quick <laughs> So, well, what what started your your interest in travel? What got you going, and where did you go? Oh man, um, what started my interest in travel? I guess I guess we'll get in the weeds immediately on this. Um, I I don't know. I've never been diagnosed with it or anything like that, but I would say that I have some degree of ADHD or ADD or something that doesn't allow me to, to just be, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't allow me to be comfortable with a status quo or just complacent. Like I constantly want to be doing things. And part of that comes from, I get not bored, but I feel like when I figure a fishery out, I, I want to be challenged again. And the single easiest way to do that is to find a new fishery and travel is the easiest way to do that. Really. Um, it's okay to know trout, like trout's where probably 99% of the fly angling community, um, begins their, their foray into the sport. But when you take what you learned in trout and you go put it against giant trevally or taman or tigerfish or arapaima or peacocks or you know whatever um you learn quickly how little you know mm. and i love that when did you start when did i start yeah when did you start leaving <sighs> your home waters and exploring new places it was probably 20, 20 or so years ago Wow. Be my guess. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to actually look. <laughs> you get to my age and time sort of becomes foggy and vague in the past a little bit. So <laughs> what did, what came first photography or travel? Um, or I imagine if you were already in, in uh, travel would have to make you a better photographer or a more inspired photographer. I would, I'd like to believe that. Sure. The uh, photography started for me when I met my wife. She was she was toting around a nice Canon camera when I met her, and my father had always dabbled in it. Uh, he had he'd actually sold a cover photo to uh, oh god, Fishing World magazine. <laughs> 
I doubt anybody that hears this will even have never heard of that magazine, but it was my grandfather high sticking a dry fly with his bamboo rod on the Metolius probably 40 years ago or something like that. Cool. And, um, yeah. And, and so I'd always been kind of around it and I took photography in middle school, but it really didn't resonate with me in conjunction with fly fishing until I was guiding on the black Canyon in Colorado. And then those two kind of met and came together and have been together for me ever since, you know, and this, this, this might be long winded and, and most people, if they've listened to any of my podcasts in the past, understand that I'm fairly verbose. I, I'm, I never get to the point quickly because I feel like there's too much surrounding the point that I need to, I need to put color to. Um, I had, uh, before the internet, before social media in its electronic form, there were these things called magazines and, uh, they were these leaflet pieces of, you know, shiny paper that you got at the time monthly from a lot of them. If you can, if you can imagine that, like it's hard to even fathom now doing a publication monthly anymore um, in our industry. And I was always inspired by where flip palette was or, you know, what, whoever was on the cover of, you know, where Barry and Kathy Beck were, you know, shooting and stuff like that. And so they all, you know, that was kind of the tipping point. Uh, you started to see these cool fish in these great places. And the photography was obviously, you know, good and inspiring. And that just sort of made me sit there and daydream. Like I'd be standing behind somebody in the San Miguel and I, my mind would be physically, I'd be there guiding them. And for brief moments, my mind would be, you know, at Walker's K in the Bahamas with flip, you know? And so, so that sort of started it off and, you know, the, I laugh about this because I, I used to tell, I, used to, I, I tell people now that the only way I could get a hold of any of the people that I wanted to ask questions about how to go do this stuff, you didn't just get to DM them on Instagram. Like that was not how you got to do that. And you certainly didn't just look them up in the phone book because in order to have a Miami phone book, you had to be in goddamn Miami. It wasn't online. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> information through the operator was only so effective. So I would send a double self-addressed stamped envelope or SASE as we used to call it back in my day uh, to the editor of a magazine and beg and plead for them to forward my note onto that person with the other SASE addressed back to me so that I would hopefully get some questions answered from, and it was usually flip or Chico or something like that. It never happened, and it really wasn't that wasn't that big of a deal. And, um, and then I'd call the fly shops down in Florida and leave messages for them. And of course, that never worked either. So I just kind of had to figure it out on my own. And I think I think uh, bone fishing was kind of the first lowest hanging fruit that seemed most attainable that I you know that I started started going after and. Yeah, from there it just sort of exploded. I was like, "Oh, this is kind of cool. I want to do more of this." I think most people share that sentiment once they do it for the first time. Yeah. So is that where things started? You with bone fishing? Yep. Where did you go? We went to Belize first. Wow. Yep. Yep. There wasn't really a lot going on uh, back in that day, and we were. We kind of went all over Belize that first time, Monkey River and Placencia and um, uh, Punta Gorda and uh, Ambergris, Belize City. And I spent a couple of weeks down there just roaming around, chasing stuff, uh, mostly finding people with boats to guide us that didn't necessarily really fly fish. Right. <laughs> so, I did that in Nicaragua it was, once. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's kind of duly blinded, guided discovery, you know, both learning something from each other. Uh, so that was fun. Um, but it made me want to do it again. And so left for the, you know, did the Bahamas after that. 
was supposed to be Cuba actually. And, uh, had all the non essential visas pulled about three months before we were going to Cuba. And so ended up having to just spend three weeks in the Bahamas instead, which was fine. Yeah. Obviously first world problems. (laughs) And, and since then, I mean, you've, you've been throughout the U S of course, the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, um, the jungle, um, Mongolia, right? Yep. Yeah, a couple times. What What do you look for in a trip? Because um, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I imagine like like any angler who has an evolution, right? I can't remember how the evolution works. It's, you know, a fish, big fish, lots of fish. I can't remember, but. Yeah, it, something think, like that. I'm, there's got to be an evolution with travelers, too. I, that's, that's very eloquently put. Yes, I believe there is. Um, I would say that for me personally, my evolution has always been to not take, and I don't know if it was really an evolution. I may not even fit in this, into this conversation, but I just, you know, in the beginning, fly fishing travel was just not that big of a deal really. And so most of the places you went weren't a well-paved path for anglers. You know, Christmas Island, sure. Florida, sure. Parts of the Bahamas, sure. Uh, some parts of Mexico, sure. Alaska, of course. But there just there just wasn't an interstate, if you will, to all these destinations like there is now. And so as a lot of these pathways to different species in different countries started to become more mainstream my attention has always veered off the road off the shoulder into the weeds and trying to find places that i like to be as close to the front of the pack going to these places as i possibly can and a lot of times i try to figure out if the outfitter or the lodge is willing to let us do some things that are outside of the norm for how they operate their business because i just i I, I just like to experience the things that are ever so slightly different, if not dramatically different. So that evolution, as you were, as you were referring to it, Tim, I think is, is fabulous. And it, it beckons to the entire sport and how anglers in the sport will evolve period. Yes. First fish, many fish, a big fish, many big fish. And then at some point you decide that you want to start catching whatever fish, how you want to catch them. If I ever have the ability to usher people past and through that initial evolution, both, you know, locally and internationally, I like, I I like to get people to the place where they, when they travel, it's, it's an experience. It's not a fishing trip. Well, I've, you know, I've, I haven't seen, I don't have access to all of your <laughs> folders, but I've I've gone through some of your Dropbox folders and I don't see a lot of fish. And I'm not saying you don't know how to catch them, <laughs> but I noticed in a lot of your photographs, it's a lot of landscape and a lot of people. Um, yeah. And so that has to be something that attracts you with travel too. For sure. And that, I think that's what I was just referring to. I, yeah. The fish is your vehicle, right? You know, whether, however, it's, however it sits in your prioritization of why you're choosing to do this trip, the fish is obviously going to be what's making you go there or propelling you to go there. My contention is when you come back from trips like this, at least in the circles that I, that I roll around in, if there's an hour conversation about a fishing trip, I would wager that about a minute to two minutes of that hour are spent on the fish. The rest of it's, Oh, this happened while getting there and at the airport, this, and then that night we did this and Dave went and did this and crashed his bike in the middle of the street in Tanal and, and thought, thought he broke his collarbone and then had to fish left-handed the whole rest of the trip. And, you know, there there's, it's adventure. That's, that's what we're doing this for. And so and I, I, in the same breath that I say that, I completely understand the comfort in returning to a place and seeing friends 
that you've made through your travels. And that's probably the part that tears me up the most is I leave these trips with true, genuine friendships. And I would love nothing more than to go back and see them. But there's always some new piece of water somewhere with new friends to make, new fish to chase, new people to see, new food to try, new bugs to bite me, whatever, uh, that I, I just have to go explore. Do you feel like these experiences with people and in communities have changed you? <laughs> Yes, uh, undoubtedly so. Uh, there's just I'm, I don't want to I don't want to go down the path of of the bubble that the U that people in the U.S. live in and how that bubble is portrayed on in media, uh, whatever whatever media stream you like to watch. But we have it so freaking good here; it's ridiculous and you travel to these other countries and you see people meet people that have so much less than what you ever even started with and yet are happy. A lot of times happy to meet you happy. They just, they're in their skin. They're comfortable and yes, they probably yearn for more, but just the ability to create that for themselves is just not something that's easily attainable and so they've resolved themselves to being just happy humans and there's a there's an impact if you can put yourself in the position of being vulnerable enough to have these raw moments with people that this will fully change how you come back to the states and and look at life around you especially when you do it as much as i have and i seek that in my travel. So it is very observant to hear you say that you don't see a lot of fish pictures. Yeah, we catch fish. And yeah, I usually catch a fish of the species that we're looking to get on a trip and then I'm done. I would rather spend my time capturing those moments for myself and for the people with me that allow them to reflect back on this trip and, and remember some of those things that without either writing it down or without somebody there to capture it would maybe over the year or two or more kind of fade into the background and not be remembered as easily. I like to capture that stuff for people. Yeah. What, I mean, you've been to so many places and I don't, man, I don't imagine you're going to slow down. What, what keeps you driven to keep traveling? <laughs> 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 uh, if yeah that's that's a fair question uh i i love it i just love it and in a in a moment of complete and utter self-centered greed i would want to i would love to live out my di my living days saying that i had seen every single watershed on the planet cool um i know and i know it's impossible so i'll die trying but i'm still gonna try huh that's interesting it's like these you know and an, an intellectual never wants to stop learning about something that they're never gonna right. there's no there's no finish line um, right so yeah there's there's a there's a hunger for something and I mean, I think our sport embodies that too, in in so many ways. You never will fully master the sport ever. I mean, for crying out loud, do you think Steve Ray Jeff went out, won his first, you know, world casting championship, and just went, yeah, there I am, there it is. No, he practices every fucking day. Yeah, to and, get better. And there's, I think it makes it better and the journey better to know that you're never going to get there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it totally does. Like when I see, you know, younger folks, you know, declaring their, their place. And it, 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 it just, it seems like it'd be more fun to feel like you might be getting close when you're 80 years old. Um, 
rather than, you know, achieve, sorry, achieving some sort of mastery um, prematurely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. It's what I've, it's what keeps me from falling asleep at night and it's what wakes <laughs> me up in the morning after I have finally dozed off. I, I wake up, I pour over images I haven't edited yet and it inspires me to do better on my next, on my next adventure. Um, I constantly seek people that trust me and my judgment on, on these experiences to join me. And I do everything I possibly can to ensure that, that the experience is as soulful as possible in every possible way that we, that we, that I can possibly affect on, on an adventure like that. And I, I mean, to some degree, I think that, you know, putting a pin in that and saying that that's travel, uh, diminishes the ability to have people feel that same way about even their local fisheries and the way we guide people around here. Um, I want even, I want people on a four hour little fishing trip to feel like we're pushing that envelope too. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think that, that this is a, this is a mantra for the sport as a whole versus just, you know, really affixing it to the travel portion because we're doing this out of curiosity and excitement and what, what it brings to us to be immersed in those outdoors. And not everybody's going to be able to go to 47 countries or even five countries or one country. And so my hope through how I capture what I am able to go do inspires people to look for that as close to home or in, in the realm of what they're capable of doing as possible. Yeah. It's what keeps people in it forever. And that's at the end of the day, this is a legacy endeavor. I think one of the, for yourself and other people. So, right. I think one of the things we forget too is, you know, like a number of years ago, all I could think about was the Seychelles. Like, Oh my Mm -hmm. God, all those species. I can't (laughs) believe it. What would that be like? It's like all I did. Um, (laughs) Like lay on the floor and like look at pictures. (laughs) like yep. a kid. Um, but they're doing the same thing. Like, they're like, Oh my God, you guys have like jacks and <laughs> right. And tarpon. And you know, it, it's, it's same, you know, and when I'm in California, I'm always like, where can I go? Where can I go? Well, a lot of people are thinking about going to California. Um, and oh, yeah. you know, we're, there was a great film a few years ago where someone went on this great adventure. Um, kind of in their backyard, not literally, it was in the ocean, but, you know, not far from home. And those opportunities are always there too. Um, it's really a state of mind. It is hundred percent state of mind. And I would totally agree with you. I, you know, living on the West coast, I five connects us to Oregon and California and Oregon somehow has curated, you know, several destination esque sort of world-renowned fisheries and somehow Washington and California have (laughs) whether you want to say avoided or however you want to reference it have not um, accrued that same sort of of global attention for the most part and maybe the OP and here in Washington but California has got some fabulous fishing to do And I'm not talking Pyramid Lake. I'm talking, you know, high alpine, small streams and lakes or um, some other names. You know, if you live on the West Coast, you've heard of some of these streams in Northern California that are epic trout fisheries. Like, there's there's a part of me that's really happy to know that there's fisheries in, in little regional pockets that are world-class and still mostly unknown to the world. Yeah. The, it, the last podcast. Um, so this is, this one's going up soon once, once it's edited, but the one that will pre- that precedes it was with Hogan Brown and it was about mm-hmm. fly fishing for striped bass in California. And yeah. I had no clue. 
that I was driving by a place where there were resident 50 pound striped bass on my mm-hmm. way to fish other places. And this one town, Calusa, I was like, oh, cool duck hunting town, you know? And then I'm like, hmm, I wonder where I can catch some stripers and just would move on, <laughs> not knowing right. that they were right there. And then, and then, you know, this, this whole state of mind thing, Justin Miller once had just finished 40 days of fly fishing for steelhead in Kamchatka. And then we went to the Trinity River and, you know, we're below a dam, um, not far below a dam, and he catches a steelhead that would be a decent trout and was so excited. And he's like, can you believe this is so great? Can you believe this? And I'm like, no, I don't believe it because you were just in Kamchatka. What do you, how can you be this excited? And, and it's right. just, he was in the right place. I wasn't. Um, and so, you know, that's. That's big, and, and you're right. Um, there are there's so much. I mean, you know, when you're a kid, you find a if you find a farm pond with three pound bass, you just discovered like <laughs> Shangri La. Yeah, right. And, yep. and and then you know something happens to a lot of anglers where they move on, but there's there's something special that they're moving away from. Um, but despite that. I can't not tap into some of the experiences you've had. Um, what, I mean, I don't even know what's going to happen when I ask this question, but what stands out? No, oh, and, and I knew that's where you were going to. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's funny. So again, I'll be a little bit long winded on this, but you mentioned the Seychelles, right? And, Um, I remember when fish and fly magazine was out and John Fisher's girlfriend had the cover, uh, in in the Seychelles. Remember that? Yeah. That was about almost 15 years ago or so. Yeah. Probably about that. And, uh, I called John at the store and got her on the phone and we were, we we were were chatting and it was funny. She was obviously not enamored with the fact that all I really wanted to do was, was talk about Seychelles and her not really buy anything, not really <laughs> do anything. It was, again, it was pre, it was really mostly pre internet and stuff like that. So that was, that was our access point. And, uh, Seychelles seemed so untouchable at the time. And like Roland Henry was somebody who I was reaching out to often to try to get information and try to figure out how to get on a trip to the Seychelles with. And, um, so as I started to tick boxes of, okay, I've been there, done that. It's, it's a little bit like if you were standing in a gravel driveway, you know, you had varied, varied sized gravel in there. And I said, Tim, I want you to, just really quickly run around the driveway and pick up the biggest pieces of gravel and get them out of the driveway. So you run, you know, you turn around, you go back and you pick up what look like really big pieces of gravel and you remove them. And then you turn around and you look and now all of a sudden you're like, well, how did I miss those big pieces of gravel? Cause now the rocks that weren't the biggest are now the biggest. And so now you're like, well, crap. And you go and you start to pull, pull those pieces of gravel out of there and you remove them and then you turn around so, you, you know, as you tick off Kamchatka and Seychelles and, you know, Argentina and Belize and Mexico and Bahamas and, uh, well, you know, and I'm not trying to say that these are just, you know, mundane places, but, the you know, the ones that, that garner the most attention from somebody early on in the, in the sport, you know, you start having to look a little bit with a little bit finer tooth comb at where you're going to go. And sometimes what's going to take you there is going to have to be a little bit outside of just being the fly fishing trip. And going back to what I said earlier, that starts to make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I get a little excited about it if fly fishing isn't the primary reason for being there. So um, Greenland, fantastic. But if I were really to put you know, the, the weight of your question on a place, it would be Bhutan, uh, simply because the, and I'll just cut to the chase on this. We were doing this first fly fishing ascent of the Drangme uh, river 
and I kind of pulled back and separated myself from the rest of the group. And I had kind of said that if I was going to be on this trip, I wanted to have my own boat to row. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be rowed down the river. And I was in this Canyon on this river in Bhutan and very few people had ever seen it before period. And I kind of started to cry because my dad had taught me to row when I was really, really young and rowing has always been my connection to water and it was that skill set that i had been sort of taught or given if you will early on that led me to this path of being able to have this once in a lifetime experience Mm -hmm. and man that was that was an emotional time in that on that trip um and the fishing was brutal if you've ever chased golden moss here, cause I'm sure everyone has, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are, they are one of the most challenging fricking species of fish to get to eat a fly. And for a m- number of different reasons, they're super picky for one. They're also super spooky for two. And they're really not in a lot of places around the world, obviously. So that would be, I think tip of my iceberg for, for, uh, places and experiences that I've been able to, been able to go to. And I know you like to find new places, but there are a number of places that you return to. And, um, you know, I think you've been to the Bahamas a lot, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Yeah. Um, what I, I don't, I've not shared this with you, but I was, I was in the Bahamas and, um, I think you had, yeah, you had just been there and, um, at the lodge, I overheard a conversation and someone was saying, what a great host you are and how you, you like to, you, it's clear that you like to take people places. Um, it's instructional. You do presentations, you share, um, what you know about, you know, the fishery and, and, and targeting fish. Um, what drives you to return to places like that and, and take others? Uh, boy. Money? Yeah, Just no. kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really funny, Tim. <laughs> I'm as cut. I drive, as I drive my 2001 Suburban with almost 300,000 miles on it around, yeah, it's money for sure. Um, the, uh, no, I think that and I, I know who you're referencing and, and that's very kind of him and sweet of him to, to say those things. Um, and I think that that was really a great trip for him to see how I really feel about, about those. Cause I had several first time saltwater anglers on that trip and I had done as much prep as I possibly could with them prior to the trip to get them to land and be ready to go day one instead of getting to, you know, midweek or at past midweek and finally getting comfortable in their skin. And, you know, we did casting things on the, on the um, dock in the evening to just try to get their game just that much better with, with everything and switched rods out so that we found a rod that they maybe were able to handle a little bit better in those conditions than the one that they were using and at the end of the day, the reason I do that is because I just see how impactful these experiences can be if you take the care to curate it as, I hate the word perfect because nothing's ever perfect, but if you take the, take the time and make the effort to curate the experience as closely and as personably to each individual that, that you know, you, that trusts you enough to go to these places with you, this is that legacy I was talking about. They are so grateful for what you showed them. You've opened about 50 new doors for them. Once they return, they know what they're capable of. They're excited to do it again. They're excited to do it again with you. And I'm not out to just have people join me. I want these people to be my friends forever when they join me on these trips. And I've been to many of their weddings and I have got my photographs hanging in their homes and offices, many of them. And they 
call me with crazy questions about all sorts of things at all different times of day and night. And I, I just, I'm a, I'm an extrovert and I just love being around people. And it's really fun to watch people have an experience that they're just overwhelmed by. I knew, I knew for you, it really would come down to the experience. And that's why I made the joke about it being a dollar thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know I about spit coffee all over my computer <laughs> when you said that. What would have been some of your more memorable trips? Um, yeah, for, I get that question all the time, right? It doesn't come across quite like that. It usually comes across as what's your favorite place you've ever been to. And in my head, you know, especially for somebody that's, that doesn't know me really well, I, I have to kind of scale back my response because they've all been memorable. My God, I've loved every place I've ever been to. Uh, so I have to look a little bit deeper at, at which ones and why. And it's a question that I feel like here again, being very, you know, experience centered on, on how and why I go places. I try to look at the person I'm talking to and answer it based on a little bit, what's going to keep them interested, if you will, because I can find any any number of reasons why certain fisheries or certain place I've been have been fantastic. Um, but, you know, like Bolivia, I think is unreal. Um, it ticks all the boxes for people that are looking for something, in, you know, and Bolivia now is a little bit more of a known entity than it was when I went eight years ago or whenever that was that Shimani opened, but You've got jungle, you've got wildlife, you've got drug sniffing dogs at the airport, a plane that you hope works and has just enough gas to get you there and get back. And um, natives that don't speak your language at all, uh, many of which may not have seen a white person before. Um, beautiful fish that take super aggressive strikes on dry flies. I mean, there's just, so that one, this last trip I did to Mongolia with my family and uh, April was unbelievable. Uh, just because here again, yes, taman are fantastic to chase, but for eight days you float this magnificent river, you're the only people on it and it's hosted by, almost entirely Mongolian people. And so you, you literally get to kind of step into their life a little bit. And that really, that really does it for me. I really enjoy seeing how other people live and what their priorities in their lives are and what drives them every day and being able to share moments in time with them from two, you know, dramatically different societies is it's fascinating. Should have gone back to, should go back to school and get a different degree, um, sociology or something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. So Mongolia, Bolivia, Greenland was, was pretty damn cool. Um, for some of the people that we got to meet out on the, um, some of the small like towns with 17 people in them. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I feel like that would be a conversation in and of itself to go too deep into that. What what destinations have you not been to that you really got your sights on? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, if I can ever get these guys that I consider friends. Um, Keith and, and Rob down at African waters to finally let me come to Gabon and, and, uh, and, uh, Cameroon. That's one I absolutely want to do. Um, 
mostly just because it's so far off the path of like we have it on the board at the store and it's so fun to watch people read that and it they almost glaze over it because it, it's such a foreign concept to think of going to countries they maybe have never heard of before <laughs> like like what in the where the hell is that even like yeah you know south southwest africa no problem um that those are two places i really want to go i was really bummed that india had their uh gt fishery in the south blow up and have them close it to tourism so i'm hoping that reopens at some point i really want to go do that i'd love to go back to oman and fish with nick on some of those beaches up there that few people have been able to go do go do and chase and go permit and camp on the camp on the beach in 100 120 degree heat um, um I don't know. Honestly, the, the exploration side of me feels like the South Pacific has more places that would be just unbelievable with a fly rod that nobody's heard of or touched. And I would love if I had ever won a lottery just to put myself on a sailboat and just cruise around and touch all these little fascinating islands that are two feet above sea level and, and see what, see what uh, awaits. Earlier when we were talking about your photos and, and, and how a lot of it is about people and places, um, that's what you are about in many ways. And um, with, you know, what, what I often see with you is a commitment to um, social and environmental um, responsibilities. Um, mm -hmm. And you're you do a lot. Um, I, I'm going to throw that out there and, and, um, not just identify the ones that I'm familiar with, but from where does that come from? And, and what things have you been doing because you are involved in fly fishing the way you are? Um, what have you been able to, um, bring forth? Huh. <laughs> Where do I where do I start to answer that, Tim? Come on, that, buddy. That's how I felt about asking it. <laughs> oh my God! Well, I think um, if I if I try to look objectively back at my life guiding, I think you know, as a guide, and I and I'll and I'll just readily admit that you know, like an angler's evolution through you know the catching of fish. I believe with, you know, guides coming into the industry and certainly new ones, the ability to, you know, for their mentors to imprint on them as guides to evolve as quickly as possible to pay close attention. I mean, we do anyway, right? As a guide, you're, you know, part of your you know, an inherent part of your job description is paying close attention to the, to the resource. Right. But I feel like you can pay close attention to the parts that facilitate the, again, the end result of what your job is, is really, really is, which is a hired gun to catch fish. And I was, I was affected pretty dramatically by a couple, a number of interactions through um, people I was guiding and through the people I was guiding for on what was important to represent their businesses and important to the people I was guiding as far as what they wanted from what they were paying for. And because of that, I just, I guess it took a while to really take hold in me. It probably came when I had my kid that I started I started looking more critically at, at what our impact was on the, on the fisheries that I was on and what, you know, and expanded from there, not just, you know, how many people are on the river now versus when I was there at that time. And not just, you know, what different diseases have some of these fisheries sort of survived through and what was the impact on them in that process of surviving it? And did they survive it? Um, 
but water flow controls and snowpack levels and earlier arrival of high water and which means earlier arrival of super low and warm water in a lot of fisheries and it's observational science and so obviously people that want to get really technical can start to pick it apart and that's totally fine too but at the end of the day 25 30 years of, of guiding and spending time on a number of watersheds there's been dramatic changes in all of those things i just mentioned and i've got some beliefs that i i probably could be coaxed into saying here but i think <laughs> you're gonna have to be really really tedious to get it out of me tim but i think that our responsibility as guides and as anglers and as consumers or adventurers or however you want to phrase it uh is more important than than what you are going to generally get out of our industry at the at the top um you know the sport wants to sell product and i know we talked earlier about calling it an industry and i totally fell flat on my face on that but the sport is one that that likes to think about growth and how do we get more people into it and part of me do we need more people in it that's (laughs) you know this is a tricky one and like i I ask myself that every day do we do we need more people in it or do we need the people in it to be better and get, you know, to better engage with what we rely on for our passion. I think we're coming up short. Those who are here, (laughs) right? Uh Oh, and I, and I know I'm a hypocrite saying that I own a fly shop and have a guide service like i this is what i wrestle with every day tim it's there's no answer to this it's just kind of kind of what's on my mind every day and so i guess all i can do to answer your original question is be a better uh conservationist preservationist uh recreationist guide uh steward whatever whatever label you want to put on it i just i'm I'm not perfect but i'm striving to be as potent in in my messaging and what i'm trying to do with the people that i get to have influence on as possible well because i understand the importance in that maybe i'm defending myself in in this one and not trying to address a comment uh that might be unfair which is that you're a hypocrite or whatever i'm called a hypocrite all the time and it's just the world that we're living not all the time but sometimes um the world that we live in is is hard right like if i'm going to eat today i'm going to be participating in systems that are unjust bad for the environment etc um i can also do my best um and i think you do that but you also go beyond that. And so you've accomplished big things with your shop. Um, You've been in, in films Um, you've led uh, or been very involved with campaigns. Um, You're on boards and you're, you're an advisor with things. Um, I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit. Maybe it'll inspire others to step up their game. Uh, That's my hope. I mean, I literally wake up every day hoping that where I choose to put my time and how I choose to explain why I've put my time there does exactly what you said, inspires people to just reflect back on themselves a little bit and see if they can just make some subtle, I'm not asking for completely overhauling how they live their lives, just start with something simple and easy and from there see where it takes you like this is going to sound crazy but i still see it like don't buy plastic water bottles for crying out loud 
why why do we still even have those right i do you remember when they came out <laughs> Yeah. It was like hilarious. None yeah. of none of us took it seriously. I think Evian was the first one I noticed. And it was it was like I remember just laughing about it. Like who in yeah. the world would do this? Who would yeah. buy water? Um but now that it's you know it seems like it would be hard for a lot of people to not buy water. I know. I know. And, it, you know, again, that's a bubble that the U.S. and Western civilization to some degree gets to be in because we have sanitary water for the most part to to consume straight out of the faucet, more so than many other parts of the world. So, yes, again, it's it it comes with a very complex sort of addressing of what that is. But, you know, you live, in, you live here in Seattle. Do you really need to buy a plastic water bottle? Really? Come on. All right. But and, and just start there. Like that's that would be like you just said, that could be a dramatic change for somebody to to just start changing their habits on how they consume water. And like just start start there. I think that one's attainable. I think that one's fairly easy. I think so too. Um something that is more significant. Um is what you've recently accomplished for your fly shop. And I'd love for you to explain this when it comes to, <laughs> because I think it needs explanation. Um, yeah, I know. It's it, uh, Go ahead. Please dive in. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So during the, during the pandemic, uh, at the very beginning of it, we were, fortunate enough to be hit with the pandemic and then where our shop is located it's connected to seattle by an eight lane bridge that is still broken and so it disconnects us from the bulk of of seattle and it's had a massive impact on business and we're down probably 35 percent and so it slowed everything down to a place where i had time to really just look at where my core values are uh, personally and what I had always kind of hoped to do through what I thought, you know, 15, 20 years ago were impactful uh, elements to the business. You know, we've always as much as possible tried to not use plastic and used to give people sort of the still do give people the choice of, you know, to you bring their own water bottle and we'll have jugs of water and stuff like that. And I mean, again, super small things. And in the grand scheme of things, my store is, my business is on, on, I don't even need to say it, but on like, like a global economy, I'm not even dust. So, but within our sport, I feel like we enlarge our presence a little bit more to where like you were saying earlier, that inspiration can be a little more tangible. So we decided to, I decided to make us a carbon neutral company. And this is of course a, not a new thing to do. And it is, as we speak, morphing out of the terms that are applied to it, net zero, carbon neutral, uh, however you, however you want to phrase that, but, um it was something our sport has has been fairly slow to move towards and honestly patagonia was talking about it a while ago and then it sort of went away from conversation a little bit but it piqued my interest enough that i started you know with all this free time i had during the pandemic to start looking at it and I met with Craig Matthews out in Montana in September and um, talked about 1% for the planet. And it just, all of it just sort of cascaded down at one time. And I just, I just, here's a time where I can, I've got the ability to be impactful both in how we operate as well as maybe, maybe inspire some other people in this industry to start moving in this direction and what i've learned is that 
most people don't understand what being carbon neutral or net zero is. And there's a fair number of people that think it's BS. And that's fine. There's always going to be people that are going to want to question what what you do on something like this. But at the end of the day, like as much as we want to do our best, and I, I really can't stand the word best, this this really is the best we can do currently with business is try to reduce our footprint as much as possible. And at the end of the day, that's really what you're doing or at least negating it as much as, as reducing it. So what did that mean for the shop? What are, what did you have to do to achieve that? So in simple terms, you start with your building. Uh, how was your, how was your building built? What's, what materials are in it? Where were they derived? What is their, um, what is the carbon that is within that, the carbon, carbonality, if you will, that's within those, within the uh, products made to, to buy, to build it. Then you move to where do you get your electricity from? And then you start addressing where all your products come from and what is the lifespan of the carbon in those products and and you basically go through and you calculate what your carbon tonnage is that you have put into the environment and then again if you go to if you go to emerger strategies and talk to Rick or go to his website and look at the calculator, you can, you can do this personally. It doesn't have to be as a business either, but it just, it helps you figure out what that looks like. And then you go about offsetting it or capturing carbon in a, in a different way that allows you to offset or negate. If I put 10 tons of carbon into the environment, I'm going to offset that with, either buying offsets in the ocean or through wind or whatever I'm going to, you know, however you're going to, you know, dribble that down and offset it or capture it so that my 10 was removed or taken care of by the 10 or more that I did over here. And there you go. And I mean, that's horribly simplistic way of putting it. Um, So I would say do some due diligence and go investigate it. Like learn what it is. Just type carbon neutrality into into Google and see what comes up. Start start delving in. Um, it's not this big scary monster that that so many people seem to be afraid of or have already attached some farce. It's a you know politically divisive uh, conversation for sure. But at the end of the day, it is the best we can do with our current state of technology and what's available to us to minimize possible climate change or slow it down. Yeah. And at the end of the day, for folks who want to make a controversy of it, um, it's eliminating carbon emissions into the atmosphere, which is a good thing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, regardless of, this sounds this sounds horribly elementary but if you had to live your life with your face six inches behind the exhaust pipe of a vehicle breathing that air every day would you enjoy it no i i don't think i would (laughs) do you think you'd get sick from that maybe i mean do you think you'd start to show signs of having inhaled all that carbon probably high likelihood and so we're just doing it on a on a massive global scale is all we're trying to do just trying to reduce that so and i yeah that is a whole other conversation for sure so i'll leave it as simple as that i think if you're all right with that that sounds good and and what are some of the other things that you've you've given your your time and talents to with respect to uh conservation preservation um and other other Um, causes yeah boy all over the place. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be an advisor for IndieFly uh, Foundation, which I think is something I hope in the in the near future to bring a little more light to, which is trying to create sustainable uh, indigenous 
people owned fishing operations in different parts of the world so that your dollars go to providing infrastructure for for the people that are you know call that fishery or that that region home and it's a and it's a really really cool um, thing that Matt's done with that and I, I look forward to being more involved with that here in the near future and uh, steelhead in the Pacific Northwest hopefully every single fly angler on the planet listens to this because it needs to be heard because every day I still have people call and and believe that <laughs> believe that you can still walk across the backs of steelhead in the Pacific Northwest it is absolutely not the case and uh, I spend a lot of time trying to help people understand the peril and what's in the future for our state fish here in Washington, the wild steelhead. It does not look great. And there's going to be some really, really difficult decisions and uh, changes in culture coming down the pipe, I have a feeling, unless we start to take some fairly drastic action soon. So, and that's at a bunch of different levels, management, uh, climate, acknowledgement, um, angling, the whole bit. It's it's not a pretty picture for, for us here. So um, what else do I do? That's a good question. I'm, it's funny. I'm sitting here on a podcast with you, Tim, and I've been on a couple others. And there's some people out there doing some really... I, I hate the word really. I need to quit using it. I don't hate it. I use it too much. But there's some people out there doing some very, very well put together podcasts, and yours is no exception. I, our podcast is going to have a little bit of EWA flavor to it, and that we're going to go a little bit off the grid with with who we bring on as guests. I think there's a lot of celebs, if you will, within the sport that have danced around all the various podcasts and I want to try to bring some people to uh, the airwaves that maybe don't or have never done a podcast but have some really insightful there's that really word again have some insightful um, things to share about what they're doing about what drives them about the state of of fisheries and uh, their uh, surrounding land and, and communities that otherwise are just getting glossed over by everything. And so we're going to interview people that you probably haven't, that a lot of people probably haven't heard on a podcast before. I'm pretty excited about that. Very cool. Yeah. And it's, I guess I can plug it. It's called EWA undercurrent and it's on all the, all the streams. Uh, it's going to be slow to, to bleed out because the people that I want to chase down to do it are very, elusive <laughs> so, and we just did one with dylan tamina the other day and and i it was such an epiphany to do it on location as opposed to studio or via zoom or anything like that that i think we're going to try to do that as frequently as possible be in on location with people doing the podcast so you can sort of glean some of the um natural surroundings into the conversation through what we're what we're talking about so should be fun cool where can folks see more of your photography see what you're up to in general um see what your shop's up to uh well we have our website which is being overhauled as we speak so there'll be a new website coming up the emeraldwateranglers.com most of the photography on there is mine though we do have five published photographers on staff so uh, you'll see more than just mine on there my photography website is probably the lowest of low priorities in my world so you can look at really old images there <laughs> otherwise on my instagram account is probably the most up-to-date which is dave mccoy ewa um Otherwise, uh, come on a trip with me. Yeah, and you can then you can have your own. My photographs as your own. The photography can come to life. That's right. Well, cool, Dave. This is overdue, and I I want to do another one with you. Um, thanks for coming on, and uh, 
and keep up the good fight and uh, look forward to seeing where your travels take you. Yeah, in well, the- uh, I would say that one of the, one day, Tim, it would be great to shake your hand. We've conversed multiple times uh, over the past 10, 12 years, and uh, I really appreciate you. <laughs> Is that really word again? I appreciate you asking me to be on here, and I look forward to hearing uh, hearing the finished product. Sounds good. Well, and you keep up the good fight too. But by the time you get to this part of the podcast, I think you've you've finished listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, be sure to check out Dave and, and check out that podcast. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Tim. Yep, thanks, Tim. Appreciate it, buddy. (laughs) Hey, listeners. This um, conversation with Dave ended, but after I stopped uh, recording, things got um, interesting again. So here comes some bonus content. I I look at Brian O'Keefe as probably one of the people that I was inspired by more, more so than anyone and just so happened to be good friends with him so i can call him anytime i want and share funny texts back and forth with each other and stuff like that and he's done a ton for me in my early years of the industry and providing me opportunities that i would maybe have never had had he not stood up and and endorsed me and (laughs) and yet today i talked to new people to the sport and i mentioned his name and they're like who yeah and it fucking saddens me, Tim. It just, it's one of the reasons I am, I'm really excited to be, a, who the fucking word really, uh, <laughs> I'm excited to be a part of the Fly Fish Museum because I, I believe the legacy of the sport needs to constantly be acknowledged and reminded even as new people come into it. Those of us that are in it currently didn't just arrive. Like we didn't just all of a sudden, whoo, here we are, poof. We were led here by people that literally saw and changed this industry more so than you will probably ever see that steep of a change in again in a long time. And we just shouldn't be forgetting that just because somebody is a 20 something and those people's images are maybe not you know, spread across the airwaves as much as they would have been had social media been around when, when they were at the height of their career. I, I want to fully acknowledge why I do what I do through the people that got me here and share that experience and that time and, and pay homage to those people for that. Because without Brian O'Keefe and that permit photo, I would never have spent Twelve, fifteen thousand dollars on godforsaken underwater housings. Yeah, it, you know it's funny as you were saying that. Um, I looked over at my bookshelf, and the names are you know Lawson, Lafontaine, um, Rosenbauer, um, Humphreys, yeah. and it's like I've been around the sport for a long time. I will not get there. I will not produce something like these guys did. No, nope, um, me either. And for me, you know, it's I, we were talking before I hit record um, on this, and you know, I don't put my name on anything because it's like, <laughs> other than this podcast, because it's w- what those just just those guys alone did is so far from anything that it's like absurd that, that I'll, that, that I might ever try to accomplish. And, you know, O'Keefe is, is, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, Atkinson and all these people who who did so much, um, you know, one lesson I learned, I did not like learning it and I was not familiar with the lesson part for a long time, but I was working for a magazine, a fly fishing magazine that was the best fly fishing magazine at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think the best fly fishing magazine since. Um, And this was, 
it's 2021. It was, I guess, 14 years ago. And I think I was in grad school. I don't remember. Maybe not. I was, I had a college degree. I'd been in the industry and I wanted to be called like an assistant editor or something like that because I was Mm -hmm. researching, doing a little bit of writing, doing a little bit of editing. And the editor was like, you're out of your mind. Like that takes a while, man. Like you've got to earn that. Like, and I was like offended because I was doing things that were editing. Right. Right. But it's true. And there's, there are so many people with those titles of photographer, writer, editor, traveler, angler, guide, mm-hmm. whose skills and accomplishments are so significant that even to this day, as a paid writer and editor, like there's, there are, I see magazine articles that are on the cover of magazines that I contributed to. Usually I don't put my name on it. And I still have a hard time calling myself a writer and editor because of some of the folks that I looked to when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, we can't lose that. No, I think there's there's a couple of points you made there that are uh, significant. One is that a lot of the titles that people adorn themselves with now are just that they're self-proclaimed and are they earned? Oh, it's, there's some subjectivity to that. But a couple of the things that um, I think are poignant in what you said are water or writing is a craft wholly under, wholly underappreciated and, and yet brings so much life and color and provides a level of humility in how, when you present it properly that would achieve so much more in imprinting on new anglers in the sport. And we just don't, with the magazines just so rapidly disappearing, we're, we're losing that. And I, Jesus, to be Jason or Tom and Jeff and, you know, editing magazines these days, I applaud their, their, you know, staunch adherence to, to the craft of writing over the old school days of the how to and looking past, you know, just putting out a publication to put one out, um, but rather trying to provide slice of life insights into little moments within the sport. It's, it's really hard, man. It's so hard. Yeah. It, and so lost sometimes with our propensity for just rapid engagement and cursory um, appreciation for things. Like we've just become so visual that the time to sit down and read and, and truly appreciate a well, a well-written piece on something is just seems to be not lost on entirely, but certainly lost on a lot of people. And that's sad. Two other books I, I see over there are from Yvon Chouinard, and it's like, yeah, he and I have been to the same place in Argentina, but it's kind of different. <laughs> it's kind of, when, <laughs> when I buy a plane ticket and then, like, have, you know, my my someone waiting at the airport for me with my name on the on the sign and and go to a nice hotel, it's different than it was in the in the late '60s or early '70s. Like, yeah, it's same place. You know, just like a guitar is a guitar for anybody, but it's different when it's like, you know, a talented guitarist. Yeah. I was going to, I got stuck because I was going to say Slash and I wanted to come up with somebody better than Slash. <laughs> slash was good. Come on, man. Was? What do you mean was? Uh, <laughs> no. Very good. He is still with us. Yes. That's right. So, still um, a good guitarist. I, I should have said like Stone Gossert because I'm talking to someone who's in Seattle. There you go. Fly uh, fisherman. It, Fly English. Oh, that's yeah. right. I forgot that he was. Is. Yeah. <laughs> is. You're, you're still, what do you mean was? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, o- o- O'Keefe is somebody had, I had on the podcast this year and it was like, wow. 
I'm going to talk to him. my favorite person. It, like, I look around the sport at the people that inspired me, and Brian, among so many that have influenced me, is the like if you want to if you want to really look at at the sport critically and the idea of the term influencer and how all these brands have ambassadors and stuff like that like we've for, we've really forgotten what that means like we've taken away the grit and the and the humility in what it means to be a brand ambassador we've we've just we've just diluted it so much and so when i step back and i look at you know the brands i'm very fortunate to be able to represent o'keefe still is probably one of the brightest shining lights with regards to somebody who embodies the term ambassador for something period yeah like he is the full meal deal he's enigmatic he's he's just a little boy still when you start talking to him about where he's been and what he's done and some of the experiences he's had like i just i just want to sit down and and have a beer with him every every chance i could ever get because i learn something new every single time i laugh until my gut hurts typically and he brings he brings so much experience and time within this sport that nobody so few people currently have and have has seen all of the transcendence of it you can't help but learn from that and and you and mentioned appreciate it. yeah you mentioned learning a couple of times and that's also a difference is that people like him are out to bring you along for the ride to teach you to you totally. know, help you get better and you know the, the people like him are so special i I think about about this from time to time. I, I think the first time I worked, I, I, it, way back when, maybe early two thousands, I would work at at shows, and at least once, Courier was at the booth next to me. I think I think Frank Smethurst and I were working for AFTA. <laughs> At the, at the yeah, at the Colorado Convention Center. He's <laughs> like, he, I think he was like, hey, do you want to work the AFTA booth with me? And I was like, sure. And I. I think it was years ah. later that I even found out what AFTA was. <laughs> right. Like I, exactly. I, I think I just hung out, but Courier was there next to us. And so, you know, he and I know each other, which, and, and, you know, we have for a while, but I have to stop saying, you know. But um, a few years ago, I mean, really, a few years ago. So it wasn't like 10 years ago, but a few years ago, I'm at a show and walking by me, he's like, hey, Tim. And I'm like, oh my God, he knows my name. <laughs> right <laughs> and of course he does like right because i know him <laughs> but <laughs> but despite that like i've got so much respect for him and his accomplishments that yep. it's like oh wow and 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 you know then i circled back around and we caught up and he's like you know have you been fishing and i was like yeah i just got back from nicaragua um so i guess this is five years ago and four years ago five and um and he's like, yeah, cool. I went there in like 89 or something like that. It was like early 90s. And I'm like, what? <laughs> the Corn Islands in 89? And like yeah. my adventure just changed, right? Because <laughs> Nicaragua in the 2000s is very different than it was, you know, coming yeah. out of 20 the years Cold earlier. War. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so um, it's just, Sandinistas and everything else going on down there. Yeah. Like I had this idea of this magazine article I was going to write at the time. And I'm like, meh. Right. I'll just let Courier tell his stories sometime. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, that perspective is grounding and it needs to be spread because, you know, there are people who are doing things that are, you know, it's one thing I keep thinking about the world of fly fishing and its heroes. And I, the way I keep thinking about it is comparing it to baseball. There are right. a lot of people who are professional while playing single A ball. Yep. That's different than being a pro in the MLB. Yep. And that's also different than 
being on an active roster and different than being an all-star and a hall of famer. And yep. <laughs> we, you have to know who the hall of famers are. Well put. Yep. Well, so talking about other podcasts and what I, what Andy Mills doing with the history of yeah. the keys and the tarpon fishing is fantastic, man. And that could so easily be done in other other parts of the country about other sort of centrified, uh, regionally specific fisheries. And as much as it's a podcast, and and I think a lot of people throw podcasts in the in the table of, well, you're just it's entertainment. He's documenting history that when these people are gone, it's gone. Right. And if you haven't documented it, there's stuff there that gets lost forever. Yeah, and especially there, you know, we have people, everyone's like, yeah, you know, uh, Stu Abt and Flip Pallet and Chico and Chico. And then it sort of like stops and everyone's knowledge of of everything that happened down there, like, it's like, right, we, it's we, regional. Yeah, it's like we really know, like, you know, 1950s baseball. But what happened? Morsky. In the yeah, right. Um, and so, um, that, yeah, that has to get documented. It has to. Be. Yeah, yeah. I I think Andy's doing a fantastic job with that with that podcast. It's pretty exciting to listen to listen to that, and it's fun to. I think I just think it's fun to step back into into in time and and close your eyes and listen to those things and envision um, what it was like to see those experiences back through those eyes in those days with the current state of things now it's fascinating i don't know if i've ever shared this story but um i was on i i was on this boat in the keys nope i was in the everglades for four days and one day it was really windy and i was with Stu apt and um, he's a bit up there in age. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's in his nineties, right? Oh, fuck. That's incredible. <laughs> I, I hope he is now. Incredible. He's probably, he's, he's going to get an email like, Hey man, I'm 72. <laughs> What's the matter? With you? I'm like Googling. You shithead. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh my God. That I, would be so funny. Okay, Here good. I just I just found an article. He is in his nineties. Um, okay, good. So, so you can rest easy on that one. <laughs> anyway, um, at that time, I think I had a pretty good following on Instagram. I already had the podcast, um, you know, stuff like that. And I was having a hard time fishing in that wind that morning. Yeah. And he was he was fishing in the front of the boat with a conventional rod and. Um, he just got up, walked over, grabbed my rod out of my hand and just like fired a laser and then <sighs> handed me the rod back and went and sat back down. I'm like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Those are the kind of experiences, Tim, that need to be given more gravity. It, 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 that's that is a that is something that anybody who's ever dreamed of tarpon fishing should want to give everything they own to have Stu come over and show you in one fell swoop, wordless, and just put you in your place to it, some degree, but show you that it can be done. Exactly, and and the cool thing too is it, it's we weren't not getting along. <laughs> But we also, we weren't going to be leaving that trip as like lifelong friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's sort of how he like. That prompted him to do that. I don't, I don't know what it was, but it was like, like, <laughs> it was cool. It was that's really so cool. rad. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm fully in favor of getting my ass handed to me at any given time when it's duly needed. Yeah. And, and then he like went back to sitting at the front cause he was, he, you know, he's at his, in his late eighties at the time. And it's, it was so cool. 
was so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay. All right. Fair enough. That's fantastic. What a great experience. Oh, you brought up Smithers. That's so funny. Oh, he, he's he's such a character. He's such a character. And, I and, love that guy. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what we got paid, but <laughs> I got overpaid for sure. And um, for me, like one of the highlights too of that that event was watching him cast for people. Um, you know, it was in part, I think, him wanting to teach people, but also, like, loving casting so much. Um, uh, you're you're just not going to find somebody that has the disease, you know, more rampantly than, than him. He's, he's afflicted horribly uh, with fly fishing. Like, just... And, and yet... I would also, I regularly quote him too. Uh, and when he did running down the man, he, right. he made a statement in that film that, you know, unfortunately most people have never seen early felt soul piece that people just need to be content catching fewer fish. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And it, that struck me so hard. Like it wasn't a slap to the face. It was me running full speed hands tied behind my back into a brick wall. Yeah. It was such an insightful comment and it was so long ago that the, I say so long ago, what 12 years ago, maybe. Uh, um, I think it was like 2007, 2006. Yeah. So 15 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that. So just such an, inc- such an incredibly insightful way of looking at things and here again that's where travel brings to the table something that may not be as recognizable in your home water that you come back impacted by well and it makes you makes you look at your home fishery just a little bit differently that's right frank um so i produced for off the grid studios season one and season two of das boat from meat eater (laughs) And and Frank was in, I think, two episodes in season one. And then he was in the final episode that I worked on um, for season two. And it came out last year, but I only watched it on for the first time on Saturday. (laughs) And um, I just I don't know why I held off on that one episode, but I was with my mom and my wife. I'm like, hey, you know, let's I want to watch this together. And so we we watched it. And um, my wife said at one point you know, isn't that, you know, didn't you used to look up to him a lot? And yeah, I did. Frank, Frank's awesome. He knows the history. He has the passion. He, he's such a legitimate angler and it's, you just want to be around him Mm -hmm. and just to have his energy. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a long time, but when Frank was a Scott Flyrod sales rep in Denver, he rolled up to the shop I was working in in a van Oh yeah. That, I remember the van. Yeah. The van had Scott on it. And mm-hmm. for a second I thought like, what's this guy's deal? And quickly realized he's, he was the coolest ever. <laughs> and he'll never hear this. Cause if like it came up, he'd be like, what's a podcast? Um, you know, let's, <laughs> let's go fishing. Right. right. He, so he trained me to guide on the Gunnison. Oh, cool. And then I, in turn, helped train Travis Rummel to guide on the Gunnison. No kidding. When I was leaving. Yeah. Wow. And Ben Knight was the town photographer for the um, Telluride Daily Planet. That's cool. And was watching him learn to fly fish. Uh, And I remember Frank one day, like the San Miguel is the easiest freaking river to catch fish on. And I was buying some trudes and, and some church tarantulas and, and Frank you know, walks up next to me and he goes, what in the hell are you, what in the hell are you buying those for? I'm like, cause the fish are eating them. He's like, Oh my God. He's like, I'm going to, I want to throw up in my mouth. Um, <laughs> that's not what you should be fishing with. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They work. He's like, I don't care. 
that's not the point. <laughs> so he goes into one of his frank dissertations on <laughs> right, all right. these small bugs and what the life cycle of the insects were and, and how as a guide you should be teaching your people how to you know understand entomology and fish with what's really in their environment and stuff like this and it was so lost on me back then but it stuck yeah the... and just a pivotal moment one of one of those pivotal moments in my in my early days of guiding that <laughs> The way he delivered it back in the day was <laughs> so fucking funny. <laughs> and, and, oh my god! You know, when I said he he does probably doesn't know what a podcast is, he's I didn't mean to insult his intelligence. He's extremely smart. It's just he's so focused on. I mean, he's such a purist, but yeah. not, he's a purist, but not. He'll he'll he's interested in innovation too. Um, yeah, not to a fault is what you're trying to say. Yeah, and so he might be like, I imagine instead of listening to podcasts, he's you know studying entomology and playing with a fly rod for hours on end to see how it casts and and then like you know reading Shakespeare or something. Um, Ironically, uh, he and one of my former employers john cochran uh i believe are working on getting a new podcast going sweet i would love that yeah there, um, there's something about the way he speaks that i'm just like okay i'll oh, drop everything i'm doing and listen yep he he's definitely blessed with that talent and it was it's never been more evident than when you give him the opportunity to to be thoughtful in the moment. Right. Yeah. And, um, allow him to just be frank and in front of people that are captivated by him. Cause I think that inspires him to, to get animated, which animated Frank is always a fun Frank to be around. <laughs> so yeah. Love that guy. 